Hello! How are we doing today? Happy Saturday. Um, hope you guys are having a great day. Uh, sorry that I'm a lot later than I thought I was going to be today. I got wrapped up in a bunch of chores and other things that, that my mom needed help with. Let me cut this down a little more. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, freaks are also people's please. This is true. Um, I finally got a breather. So here I am like four and a half hours late than I thought I was going to be today, but that's all right. Um, <clears throat> It's great to see you guys. Thank you all for being here. Um, today, the plan is to get through four, the first four chapters of the Carnivorous Carnival. Um, you guys let me know how audio levels are. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the House of Freaks. You guys let me know how audio levels are. I want the music to be just quietly in the background, um, but not too loud. So you kind of just can let me know how that, how that goes as we go. I was doing okay until you called me a freak. <laughs> I'm sorry, Summer. I hope you're feeling better today, um, or if not, that you're resting a lot today. Okay, thanks, Rady. Thanks. All right, so I'm just going to go ahead and jump right in without further ado. <clears throat> Just let me know if at any point the music gets too loud or too quiet. Um, just scream at me or whatever. Okay. The Carnivorous Carnival by Lemony Snicket. For Beatrice, our love broke my heart and stopped yours. Chapter 1. When my workday is over and I have closed my notebook, hidden my pen, and sawed holes in my rented canoe so that it cannot be found, I often like to spend the evening in conversation with my few surviving friends. Sometimes we discuss literature. Sometimes we discuss the people who are trying to destroy us, and if there is any hope of escaping from them. And sometimes we discuss frightening and troublesome animals that might be nearby, and this topic always leads to much disagreement over which part of a frightening and troublesome beast is the most frightening and troublesome. Some say the teeth of the beast, because teeth are used for eating children, and often their parents, and gnawing their bones. Some say the claws of the beast, because claws are used for ripping things to shreds. And some say the hair of the beast, because hair can make allergic people sneeze. But I always insist that the most frightening part of any beast is its belly, for the simple reason that if you are seeing the belly of the beast, it means you have already seen the teeth of the beast, and the claws of the beast, and even the hair of the beast, and now you are trapped, and there is probably no hope for you. For this reason, the phrase, in the belly of the beast, has become an expression which means inside some terrible place with little chance of escaping safely, and it is not an expression one should look forward to using. I'm sorry to tell you that this book will use the expression the belly of the beast three times before it is over, not counting all of the times I have already used the belly of the beast in order to warn you of all the times the belly of the beast will appear. Three times over the course of this story, characters will be inside some terrible place with little chance of escaping safely and for that reason I would put down this book and escape safely yourself because this woeful story is so very dark and wretched and damp that the experience of reading it will make you feel as if you are in the belly of the beast, and that time doesn't count either. The Baudelaire orphans were in the belly of the beast, that is, in the dark and cramped trunk of a long black automobile. Unless you are a small, portable object, you probably prefer to sit in a seat when you are traveling by automobile, so that you can lean back against the upholstery, look out the window at the scenery going by, and feel safe and secure with a seat belt fastened low and tight across your lap. But the Baudelaire's could not lean back, and their bodies were aching from squishing up against one another for several hours. They had no window to look out of, only a few bullet holes in the trunk made from some violent encounter I have not found the courage to research. And they felt anything but safe and secure as they tried to think, as they thought about the other passengers in the car and tried to imagine where they were going. 
The driver of the automobile was a man named Count Olaf, a wicked person with one eyebrow instead of two, and a greedy desire for money instead of respect for other people. The Baudelaires had first met Count Olaf after receiving the news that their parents had been killed in a terrible fire, and had soon discovered he was only interested in the enormous fortune their mother and father had left behind. With unceasing determination, a phrase which here means no matter where the three children went, Count Olaf had pursued them, trying one dastardly technique after another to get his hands on their fortune. So far, he had been unsuccessful, although he'd had plenty of help from his girlfriend, Esme Squalor, an equally wicked, if more fashionable, person who was now sitting beside him in the front seat of the automobile, and an assortment of assistants, including a bald man with an enormous nose, two women who liked to wear white powder all over their faces, and a nasty man who had hooks instead of hands. All of these people were sitting in the back of the automobile where the children could sometimes hear them speaking over the roar of the engine and the sounds of the road. One would think, with such a wretched crew as traveling companions, that the Baudelaire siblings would have found some other way to travel rather than sneaking into the trunk, but the three children had been fleeing from circumstances even more frightening and dangerous than Olaf and his assistants, and there had been no time to be choosy. But as their journey wore on, Violet, Klaus, and Sunny grew more and more worried about their situation. The sunlight coming in through the bullet holes fa faded to evening, and the road beneath them turned bumpy and rough, and the Baudelaire orphans tried to imagine where it was they were going and what would happen when they got there. Are we there yet? The voice of the hook-handed man broke a long silence. I told you not to ask me that anymore, replied Olaf with a snarl. We'll get there when we get there, and that's that. Could we possibly make a short stop? Asked one of the white-faced women. I noticed a sign for a rest station in a few miles. We don't have time to stop anywhere, Olaf said sharply. If you needed to use the bathroom, you should have gone before we left. But the hospital was on fire, the woman whined. Yes, let's stop, said the bald man. We haven't had anything to eat since lunch, and my stomach is grumbling. We can't stop, Esme said. There are no restaurants out here in the hinterlands that are in. Violet, who was the eldest of the Baudelaire's, stretched to place her hand on Klaus's stiff shoulder and held her baby sister Sunny even tighter, as if to communicate with her siblings without speaking. Esme Squalor was constantly talking about whether or not things were in, a word she liked to use for stylish, but the children were more interested in overhearing where the car was taking them. The hinterlands were a vast and empty place very far from the outskirts of the city, without even a small village for hundreds of miles. Long ago, the Baudelaire parents had promised they would bring their children here some day to see the famous hinterland sunsets. Klaus, who was a voracious reader, had read descriptions of the sunsets that had made the whole family eager to go, and Violet, who had a real talent for inventing things, had even begun building a solar oven so the family could enjoy grilled cheese sandwiches as they watched the dark blue light spread eerily over the hinterlands cacti while the sun slowly sank behind the distant and frosty Mortmain Mountains. Never did the three siblings imagine that they would visit the hinterlands by themselves, stuffed in the trunk of a car of a villain. Boss, are you sure it's safe to be way out here? Asked the hook-handed man. If the police come looking for us, there'll be no place to hide. We could always disguise ourselves again, the bald man said. Everything we need is in the trunk of the car. We don't need to hide, Olaf replied, and we don't need to disguise ourselves either. Thanks to that silly reporter at the Daily Punctilio, the whole world thinks I'm dead, remember? You're dead, Esme said with a nasty chuckle. And the three Baudelaire brats are murderers. We don't need to hide, we need to celebrate. We can't celebrate yet, Olaf said. There are two last things we need to do. First, we need to destroy the last piece of evidence that could send us to jail. The Snicket file, Esme said, and the Baudelaire shuddered in the trunk. The three children had found one page of the Snicket file, which was now safe in Klaus's pocket. It was difficult to tell from only one page, but the Snicket file seemed to contain information about a survivor of the fire, and the Baudelaires were eager to find the remaining pages before Olaf did. Yes, of course, the hook-handed man said. We have to find the Snicket file. But what's the second thing? We have to find the Baudelaires, you idiot, Olaf snarled. If we don't find them, then we can't steal their fortune and all my schemes will be a waste. I haven't found your schemes to be a waste, said one of the white-faced women. I've enjoyed them very much, even if we haven't gotten the fortune. Do you think all three of those bratty orphans got out of the hospital alive? The bald man asked. 
Those children seem to have all the luck in the world, Count Olaf said. So they're all probably alive and well, but it sure would make things easier if one or two of them had burned to a crisp. We only need one of them alive to get the fortune. I hope it's sunny, the hook-handed man said. It was fun putting her in a cage, and I look forward to doing that again. I myself hope it's Violet, Olaf said. She's the prettiest. I don't care who it is, Esme said. I just want to know where they are. Well, Madam Lulu will know, Olaf said. With her crystal ball, she'll be able to tell us where the orphans are, where the file is, and everything else we want to know. I never believed in things like crystal balls, remarked a white-faced woman. But when this Madame Lulu started telling you how to find the Baudelaire's every time they escaped, I learned that fortune-telling must be real. Stick with me, Olaf said, and you'll learn lots of new things. Oh, here's the turn for rarely ridden road. We're almost there. The car lurched to the left and the Baudelaire's lurched with it, rolling to the left-hand side of the trunk, along with the many items Olaf kept in his car to help with his dastardly plots. Violet tried not to cough as one of the fake beards tickled her throat. Klaus held his hand up to his face so that a sliding toolbox wouldn't break his glasses, and Sunny shut her mouth tightly so she wouldn't get one of Olaf's dirty undershirts tangled in her sharp teeth. Rarely ridden road was even bumpier than the highway they had been traveling on, and the car made so much noise that the children could not hear any more of the conversation until Olaf pulled the automobile to a creaky stop. "'Are we there yet?' the hook-handed man asked. "'Of course we're here, you fool,' Olaf said. "'Look, there's the sign, Caligari Carnival.' "'Where is Madame Lulu?' asked the bald man. "'Where do you think?' Esme asked, and everyone laughed." The doors of the automobile opened with a scraping sound and the car lurched again as everyone piled out. "'Should I get the wine out of the trunk, boss?' the bald man asked. The Baudelaire's froze. "'No,' Count Olaf replied. "'Madame Lulu will have plenty of refreshments for us.' The three children lay very still and listened as Olaf and his troop trudged away from the car. Their footsteps grew fainter and fainter until the siblings... <clears throat> could hear nothing but the evening breeze as it whistled through the bullet holes, and at last it seemed safe for the Baudelaire orphans to speak to one another. "'What are we going to do?' Violet whispered, pushing the beard away from her. "'Meryl,' Sunny said. Like many people her age, the youngest Baudelaire sometimes used language that was difficult for some people to understand, but her siblings knew at once that she meant something like, "'We'd better get out of this trunk.' "'As soon as possible,' Klaus agreed. "'We don't know how soon Olaf and his troop will return.' Violet, do you think you can invent something to get us out of here? It shouldn't be too hard, Violet said, with all this stuff in the trunk. She reached out her hand and felt around until she found the mechanism that was keeping the trunk closed. I've studied this kind of latch before, she said. All I need to move it is a loop of strong twine. Feel around and see if we can see something. There's something wrapped around my left arm, Klaus said, squirming around. It feels like it might be part of the turban Olaf wore when he disguised himself as Coach Genghis. That's too thick, Violet said. It needs to slip between two parts of the lock. Semja, Sunny said. That's my shoelace, Sunny, Klaus said. We'll save that as a last resort, Violet said. We can't have you tripping all over the place if we're going to escape. Wait, I think I found something underneath the spare tire. What is it? I don't know, Violet said. It feels like a skinny cord with something round and flat at the end. I bet it's a monocle, Klaus said. You know that funny eyepiece that Olaf wore when he was pretending to be Gunther, the auctioneer? Oh, I think you're right, Violet said. Well, this monocle helped Olaf with his scheme, and now it's going to help us with ours. Sunny, try to move over a bit so I can see if, if this will work. Sunny squirmed over as far as she could, and Violet reached around her siblings and slipped the cord of Olaf's monocle around the lock of the trunk. The three children listened as Violet wiggled her invention around the latch, and after only a few seconds, they heard a quiet click, and the door of the trunk swung open with a long, slow creak... As the cool air rushed in, the Baudelaire stayed absolutely still in case the noise of the trunk caught Olaf's attention, but apparently he and his assistants were too far away to hear. Because after a few seconds, the children could hear nothing but the chirping of the evening crickets and the faint barking of a dog. The Baudelaires looked at one another, squinting in the dim light, and without another word, Violet and Klaus climbed out of the trunk and then lifted their sister out into the night. The famous hinterland sunset was just ending, and everything the children saw was bathed in dark blue, as if Count Olaf had driven them into the depths of the ocean. There was a large wooden sign with the words Caligari Carnival, printed in old-fashioned script, along with a faded painting of a lion chasing a frightened little boy. Behind the sign was a small booth advertising tickets for sale, and a phone booth that gleamed in the blue light. 
Behind these two booths was an enormous roller coaster, a phrase which here means a series of small carts where people can sit and race up and down steep and frightening hills of tracks for no discernible reason. But it was clear, even in the fading light, that the roller coaster had not been used for quite some time, because the tracks and carts were overgrown with ivy and other winding plants, which made the carnival attraction look as if it were about to sink into the earth. Past the roller coaster was a no row of enormous tents, shivering in the evening breeze like jellyfish, and alongside each tent was a caravan, which is a wheeled carriage used as a home by people who travel frequently. The caravans and tents all had different designs painted on the sides, and the Baudelaire's knew at once which caravan was Madame Lulu's because it was decorated with an enormous eye. The eye matched the one tattooed on Count Olaf's left ankle, the one the Baudelaire's had seen many times in their lives, and it made them shiver to think they could not escape it, even in the hinterlands. Now that we're out of the trunk, Klaus said, let's get out of the area. Olaf and his troop could be back any minute. But where are we going to go? Violet asked. We're in the hinterlands. Olaf's comrade said there was no place to hide. Well, we'll have to find one, Klaus said. It can't be safe to hang around any place where Count Olaf is welcome. Aye, Sunny agreed, pointing to Madame Lulu's caravan. But we can't go wandering around the countryside again, Violet said. The last time we did that, we ended up in even more trouble. Maybe we could call the police from that phone booth, Klaus said. Dragnet, Sonny said, which meant, but the police think we're murderers. I suppose we could try to reach Mr. Poe, Violet said. He didn't answer the telegram we sent him asking for help, but maybe we'll have better luck on the phone. The three siblings looked at one another without much hope. Mr. Poe was the vice president of orphan affairs at Mulctuary Money Management, a large bank in the city, and part of his job was overseeing the Baudelaire's affairs after the fire. Mr. Poe was not a wicked person, but he had mistakenly placed them in the company of so much wickedness that he had been almost as wicked as an actual wicked person, and the children were not particularly eager to contact him again, even if it was all they could think of. It's probably a slim chance he'll be of any help, Violet admitted, but what have we got to lose? Well, let's not think about that, Klaus replied and walked over to the phone booth. Maybe Mr. Poe will at least allow us to explain ourselves. Veriz, Sonny said, which meant something like, we'll need money to make a phone call. I don't have any, Klaus said, reaching into his pockets. Do you have any money, Violet? Violet shook her head. Let's call the operator and see if there's some way that we can place a call without paying for it. Klaus nodded and opened the door of the booth so he and his sisters could crowd inside. Violet lifted the receiver and dialed O for operator, while Klaus lifted up Sonny so all three siblings could hear the conversation. Operator, said the operator. Good evening, Violet said. My siblings and I would like to place a call. Please deposit the proper amount of money, the operator said. We don't have the proper amount of money, Violet said. We don't have any money at all, but this is an emergency. There was a faint wheezing noise from the phone, and the Baudelaire's realized the operator was sighing. What is the exact nature of your emergency? Violet looked down at her siblings and saw the last of the sunset's blue light reflecting off Klaus's glasses and Sunny's teeth. As the dark closed around them, the nature of their emergency seemed so enormous that it would take the rest of the night to explain it to the telephone operator. And the eldest Baudelaire tried to figure out how she could summarize, a word which here means tell their story in a way that would convince the operator to let them talk to Mr. Poe. Well, she said, my name is Violet Baudelaire, and I'm here with my brother Klaus and my sister Sunny. Our names might sound f a bit familiar to you because the Daily Punctilio has recently published an article saying that we're Veronica, Clyde, and Susie Baudelaire, and that we're murderers who killed Count Omar. But Count Omar is really Count Olaf, and he's not really dead. He faked his death by killing another person with the same tattoo, and he framed us for the murder. Well, recently he destroyed a hospital while trying to capture us, but we managed to hide in the trunk of his car as he drove off with his comrades. And now we've gotten out of the trunk, and we're trying to reach Mr. Poe so he can help us get a hold of the Snicket file, which we think might explain what the initials VFD stand for, and if one of our parents survived the fire after all. I know it's a really complicated story, and it may seem unbelievable to you, but we're all by ourselves in the hinterlands, and we don't know what else to do. The story was so terrible that Violet had cried a little while telling it and she brushed a tear from her eye as she waited for a reply from the operator, but no voice came out of the phone. The three Baudelaire's listened carefully, but all they could hear was the empty and distant sound of a telephone line. Hello? Violet said finally. 
The telephone said nothing. Hello? Violet said again. Hello? Hello? The telephone did not answer. Hello? Violet said as loud as she dared. I think we'd better hang up, Klaus said gently. But why isn't anyone answering? Violet cried. I don't know, Klaus said, but I don't think the operator's going to help us. Violet hung up the phone and opened the door of the booth. Now that the sun was down, the air was getting colder, and she shivered in the evening breeze. Who will help us? she asked. Who will take care of us? We'll have to take care of ourselves, Klaus said. Efri, Sunny said, which meant, but we're in real trouble now. We sure are, Violet agreed. We're in the middle of nowhere, with no place to hide, and the whole world thinks we're criminals. How do criminals take care of themselves out in the hinterlands? The Baudelaire's heard a burst of laughter, as if in reply. The laughter was quite faint, but in the still of the evening, it made the children jump. Sunny pointed, and the children could see a light in one of the windows in Madame Lulu's caravan. Several shadows moved across the window, and the children could tell that Count Olaf and his troop were inside, chatting and laughing while the Baudelaire orphans shivered outside in the gloom. Let's go see, Klaus said. Let's go find out how criminals take care of themselves. That's the end of chapter one. Well, I hope it came back for you, Unknown. I'm sure it's quite nice in my beastly belly. It's probably warm. You take Skippy, orphans. You can't wait for Jif and be choosy moms. Thank you for shout outs. Voracious reader. My internet opted to just randomly repeat vile, 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 but the rest of the audio continued. That's weird. A very voracious reader. Have fun on your lurk, Summer. Grilled, ch toasty children, grilled children. Did I say grilled children? Instead of grilled cheeses? Did I say grilled children? The schnicket schnile. The pleasant whistling of the wind through the bullet holes in the trunk of a car, majestic. So purdy, that in imagery. I chase frightened little boys often. That's a pick of me. Oh, you guys are so... So sweet. Riddy is very lovely. She's a very lovely lioness. Can confirm. Living like criminals. Olaf wanted one of the kids to be killed in the fire. Grilled children. I think I- did I- if I said grilled children instead of grilled cheeses, I'm gonna be disappointed. <laughs> Let me see what I said. Who had begun building a solar oven so the family could enjoy grilled cheese sandwiches as they watched the dark blue light? Oh, I didn't say- Oh, oh, oh. I didn't say grilled children. Okay. I thought you guys were saying I had, like, misspoken and I said grilled children and I did not remember doing that. <laughs> it was just- a, Oh, it was just about the fire comment, not about grilled cheese. Oh, okay. I was like, what? Oh, I'm so sorry if I said that. I'm sure that's very confusing. <clears throat> okay. Moving along. Um, chapter two. <clears throat> Excuse me. Chapter two. Eavesdropping, a word which here means listening in on interesting conversations you're not invited to join is a valuable thing to do, and it is often an enjoyable thing to do. But it is not a polite thing to do, and like most impolite things, you are bound to get into trouble if you get caught doing it. 
The Baudelaire orphans, of course, had plenty of experience not getting caught, so the three children knew how to walk across as quietly as possible the grounds of Caligari Carnival and how to crouch as invisibly as possible outside the window of Madame Lulu's caravan. If you had been there that eerie blue evening, and nothing in my research indicates that you were, you wouldn't have heard even the slightest rustle from the Baudelaire's as they eavesdropped on their enemies. Count Olaf and his troop, however, were making plenty of noise. Madam Lulu, Count Olaf was roaring as the children pressed up against the side of the caravan so that they would be hidden in the shadows. Madam Lulu, pour us some wine. Arson and escaping from the authorities always makes me very thirsty. I'd prefer buttermilk served in a paper carton. Esme said, that's the new inn beverage. Five glasses of wine and a carton of buttermilk coming up, please, answered a woman in an accent the children recognized. Not so long ago, when Esme Squalor had been the Baudelaire's caretaker, Olaf had disguised himself as a person who did not speak English well, and as part of his disguise, he had spoken in an accent very similar to the one they were hearing now. The Baudelaire's tried to peer through the window and catch a glimpse of the fortune teller, but Madame Lulu had shut her curtains tightly. I'm thrilled, pleased to see you, my Olaf. Welcome to the caravan of mine. How is life for you? We've been swamped at work, the hook-handed man said, using a phrase which here means chasing after innocent children for quite some time. Those three orphans have been very difficult to capture. Do not worry of the children, please, Madame Lulu replied. My crystal ball tells me that my Olaf will prevail. If that means murder innocent children, one of the white-faced women said, then that's the best news we've heard all day. Prevail means win, Olaf said, but in my case, that's the exact same thing as killing those Baudelaire's. Exactly when does the crystal ball say I will prevail, Lulu? Very soon, please, Madame Lulu replied. What gifts have you brought me from your traveling, my Olaf? Well, let's see, Olaf replied. There's a lovely pearl necklace I stole from one of the nurses at Heimlich Hospital. You promised me I could have that, Esme said. Give her one of those uh, crow hats you snatched from the village of Faldevotes. I tell you, Lulu, Olaf said, your fortune-telling abilities are amazing. I never would have guessed that the Baudelaire's were hiding out in that stupid town, but your crystal ball knew right away. Magic is magic, please, Lulu replied. More wine, my Olaf? Thank you, Olaf said. Now, Lulu, we need your fortune-telling abilities once more. The Baudelaire brat slipped away from us again, the bald man said, and the boss was hoping you'd be able to tell us where they went. Also, the hook-handed man said, we need to know where the Snicket file is. And we need to know if one of the Baudelaire parents survived the fire, Esme said. The orphans seem to think so, but your crystal ball could tell us for sure. And I'd like some more wine, one of the white-faced women said. So many demands you make, Madame Lulu said in her strange accent. Madame Lulu remembers, please, when you would only visit for the pleasure of my company, my Olaf. There isn't time for that tonight, Olaf replied quickly. Can't you consult your crystal ball right now? You know rules of crystal ball, my Olaf, Lulu replied. At night, the crystal ball must be sleeping in the fortune-telling tent, and at sunrise, you may ask one question. Then I'll ask my first question tomorrow morning, Olaf said, and will stay until all my questions are answered. Oh, my Olaf, Madame Lulu said, please, times are very hard for Caligari Carnival. It's not good business idea to have Carnival in Hinterlands, so there are not many people to see Madame Lulu or Crystal Ball. Caligari Carnival gift caravan has lousy souvenirs, and Madame Lulu has not enough freaks, please, in the house of freaks. You see, my visit, you visit my Olaf with troop, and stay many days, drink my wine, and eat all of my snackings. The roast chicken is very delicious, the hook-handed man said. Madame Lulu has no money, please, Lulu continued. It's hard, my Olaf, to do fortune-telling for you when Madame Lulu is so poor. The caravan of mine has leaky roof, and Madame Lulu needs money, please, to do repairs. I've told you before, Olaf said. Once we get the Baudelaire fortune, the carnival will have plenty of money. You said that about Quagmire fortune, my Olaf, Madame Lulu said, and about Snicket fortune, but never a penny does Madame Lulu see. We must think, please, of something to make Caligari Carnival more popular. Madame Lulu was hoping that troop of my Olaf could put on a big show like The Marvelous Marriage. Many people would come to see. The boss can't get up on stage, the bald man said. Planning schemes is a full-time job. 
Besides, Esme said, I've retired from show business. All I want to be now is Count Olaf's girlfriend. There was a silence, and the only thing the Baudelaire's could hear from Lulu's caravan was the crunch of someone chewing on chicken bones. There was a long sigh, and Lulu spoke very quietly. You did not tell me, my Olaf, that Esme was the girlfriend of you. Perhaps Madame Lulu will not let you and Troop stay at Carnival of Mine. Now, now, Lulu, Count Olaf said, and the children shivered as they eavesdropped. Olaf was talking in a tone of voice the Baudelaire's had heard many times when he was trying to fool someone into thinking he was a kind and decent person. Even with the curtains closed, the Baudelaire's could tell he was giving Madame Lulu a toothy grin and that his eyes were shining brightly beneath his one eyebrow as if he were about to tell a joke. Did I ever tell you about how I began my career as an actor? It's a fascinating story, the hook-handed man said. It certainly is, Olaf agreed. Give me some more wine and I'll tell you. Now then, as a child, I was always the most handsome fellow at school. And one day, a young director... The Baudelaire's had heard enough. The three children had spent enough time with the villain to know that once he began talking about himself, he continued until the cows came home. A phrase which here means until there was no more wine and they tiptoed away from Madame Lulu's caravan and back toward Count Olaf's car so they could talk without being overheard. In the dark of night, the long black automobile looked like an enormous hole, and the children felt as if they were about to fall into it as they tried to decide what to do. I guess we should leave, Klaus said uncertainly. It's definitely not safe around here, but I don't know where we can go in the hinterlands. There's nothing for miles and miles but wilderness, and we could die of thirst or be attacked by wild animals. Violet looked around quickly as if something were about to attack them that very moment, but the only wild animal in view was the painted lion on the carnival sign. Even if we found someone else out there, she said, they'd probably think we were murderers and call the police. Also, Madame Lulu promised to answer all of Olaf's questions tomorrow morning. You don't think Madame Lulu's crystal ball really works, do you? Klaus asked. I've never read any evidence that fortune telling is real. But Madame Lulu keeps telling Count Olaf where we are, Violet pointed out. She must be getting her information from some place. If she can really find out the location of the Snicket file or learn if one of our parents are alive. Her voice trailed off, but she did not need to finish her sentence. All three Baudelaire's knew that finding out if someone survived the fire was worth the risk of staying nearby. Sandover, Sonny said, which meant, so we're staying. We should at least stay the night, Klaus agreed. But where can we hide if we don't stay out of sight, someone's likely to recognize us. Carnies? Sonny asked. The people in the caravans work for Madame Lulu, Klaus said. Who knows if they'd help us or not? I have an idea, Violet said, and walked over to the back of Count Olaf's car. With a creak, she opened the trunk again and leaned down inside. Nuts, Sonny said, which meant, I don't think that's a good idea, Violet. Sonny's right, Klaus said. Olaf and his henchmen might come back any minute to unpack the trunk. We can't hide in there. We're not going to hide in there, Violet said. We're not going to hide at all. After all, Olaf and his troop never hide, and they manage to not be recognized. We're going to disguise ourselves. Gabro, huh? Sonny asked. Why wouldn't it work, Violet replied. Olaf wears these disguises, and he manages to fool everyone. If we fool Madame Lulu into thinking we're somebody else, we can stay around and find the answers to our questions. It seems risky, Klaus said, but I suppose it's just as risky as trying to hide someplace. Who should we pretend to be? Let's look through the disguises, Violet said, and see if we get any ideas. We'll have to feel through them, Klaus said. It's too dark to look through anything. The Baudelaire stood in front of the open trunk and searched inside to begin their search. As I'm sure you know, whenever you're examining someone else's belongings, you're bound to learn many interesting things about the person of which you were not previously aware. You might examine some letters your sister received recently, for instance, and learn that she was planning on running away with an archduke. You might examine the suitcases of another passenger on a train you're taking, and learn that he had secretly been photographing you for the past six months. I recently looked in the refrigerator of one of my enemies and learned she was a vegetarian, or at least pretending to be one, or had a vegetarian visiting her for a few days. And as the Baudelaire orphans examined some of the objects in Olaf's trunk, they learned a great deal of unpleasant things. Violet found part of a brass lamp she remembered from living with Uncle Monty, and learned that Olaf had stolen from her poor guardian in addition to murdering him. 
<clears throat> Klaus found a large shopping bag from the inn boutique and learned that Esme Squalor was just as obsessed with fashionable clothing as she ever was. And Sunny found a pair of pantyhose covered in sawdust and learned that Olaf had not washed his receptionist disguise since he'd used it last. But the most dismaying thing the children learned from searching the trunk was Olaf's car, of Olaf's car, was just how many disguises he had at his disposal. They found the hat Olaf used to disguise himself as a ship captain and the razor he had probably used to shave his head in order to resemble a lab assistant. They found the expensive running shoes he had worn to disguise himself as a gym teacher and the plastic ones he had used when he was pretending to be a detective. But the siblings also found plenty of costumes they had never seen before and it seemed as though Olaf could keep on disguising himself forever, following the Baudelaire's to location after location, always appearing with a new identity and never getting caught. We could disguise ourselves as almost anybody, Violet said. Look, here's a wig that makes me look like a clown, and here's one that makes me look like a judge. I know, Klaus said, holding up a large box with several drawers. This appears to be a makeup kit complete with fake mustaches, fake eyebrows, and even a pair of glass eyes. Twitcho, Sunny said, holding up a long white veil. No thank you, Violet said. I already had to wear that veil once when Olaf nearly married me. I'd rather not wear it again. Besides, what would a bride be wandering, doing wandering around the hin hinterlands? Look at this long robe, Klaus said. It looks like something a rabbi would wear, but I don't know if Madame Lulu would believe that a rabbi would visit her in the middle of the night. Ginwan, Sunny said, using her teeth to wrap a pair of sweatpants around her. The youngest Baudelaire meant something like, all of these clothes are too big for me, and she was right. That's even bigger than the pinstripe suit Esme bought you. Klaus said, helping his sister get it disentangled. No one would believe that a pair of sweatpants was walking around a carnival by itself. All these clothes are too big, Violet said. Look at this beige coat. If I tried to disguise myself in it, I'd only look freakish. Freakish, Klaus said. That's it! Was it? Sunny asked. Madame Lulu said she didn't have enough freaks in the house of freaks. If we find disguises that make us look freakish and tell Lulu we're looking for work, she might hire us as part of the carnival. But what exactly do freaks do? Violet asked. I read a book once about a man named a man named John Merrick, Klaus said. He had a horrible birth defects that made him look terribly deformed. A carnival put him on display as part of a house of freaks, and people paid money to go into a tent and look at him. Why would people want to look at someone with birth defects? Violet said. That sounds cruel. It was cruel, Klaus said. The crowd often threw things at Mr. Merrick and called him names. I'm afraid the House of Freaks isn't a very pleasant form of entertainment. You'd think that someone would put a stop to it, Violet said, but you'd think somebody would put a stop to Count Olaf, too, and nobody does. Radov, Sunny said with a nervous look around them. By Radov, she meant somebody's going to put a stop to us if we don't disguise ourselves soon, and her siblings nodded solemnly in agreement. Here's some kind of fancy shirt, Klaus said. It's covered in ruffles and bows, and here's an enormous pair of pants with fur on the cuffs. Could both of us wear them at once? Violet asked. Both of us, Klaus said. I suppose so, if we kept on our clothes underneath so Olaf's would fit. We could each stand on one leg and tuck our other legs inside. We'd have to lean against one another as we walked, but I think it might work. And we could do the same thing with one shirt, Violet said. We could each put one arm through a sleeve and keep the other tucked inside. But we couldn't hide one of our heads, Klaus pointed out. And with both of our heads poking out at the top, we'd look like some sort of two-headed person, Violet finished, and a two-headed person is exactly what a house of freaks would put on display. That's good thinking, Klaus said. People won't be on the lookout for a two-headed person, but we'll be on, we'll, but we'll need to disguise our faces, too. The makeup kit will take care of that, Violet said. Mother taught me how to draw fake scars on myself when she appeared in that play about the murderer. And here's a can of talcum powder, Klaus said. We could use this to whiten our hair. Do you think Count Olaf will notice that these things are missing from his trunk? Violet asked. I doubt it, Klaus said. The trunk isn't very well organized, and I don't think he's used some of these disguises for a long time. I think we can take enough to become a two-headed person without Olaf missing anything. Beru? Sunny said, which meant, what about me? These disguises are made for fully grown people, Violet said, but I'm sure we can find you something. Maybe you could fit inside one of the shoes and be a person with just a head and a foot? Well, that's plenty freakish. Chellish, Sunny said, which meant something along the lines of, I'm too big to fit inside a shoe. That's true, Klaus said. It's been a while since you were shoe-sized. 
He reached inside the trunk and pulled out something short and hairy, as if he'd caught a raccoon. But this might work, he said. I think this is the fake beard that Olaf wore when he was pretending to be Stefano. It's a long beard, so it might work as a short disguise. Let's find out, Violet said, and let's find out quickly. The Baudelaire's found out quickly. In just a few minutes, the children found out just how easy it was to transform themselves into entirely different people. Violet, Klaus, and Sonny had some experience in disguising themselves, of course. Klaus and Sonny had used medical coats at Heimlich Hospital in a plan to rescue Violet, and even Sonny could remember when all three siblings had occasionally worn costumes for their own amusement, back when they'd lived in the Baudelaire mansion with their parents. But this time, the Baudelaire orphans felt more like Count Olaf and his troop, as they worked quietly and hurriedly in the night to erase all traces of their true identities. Violet felt through the make makeup kit until she found several pencils that were normally used to make one's eyebrows more dramatic, and even though it was simple and painless to draw scars on Klaus's face, it felt as if she were breaking the promise she had made to her parents, a very long time ago, that she would always look after her siblings and keep them away from harm. Klaus helped Sunny wrap herself in Olaf's fake beard, but when he saw her eyes and the tips of her teeth peeking out of the mess of scratchy hair, it felt as if he'd fed his baby sister to some tiny but hungry animal. And as Sunny helped her siblings button themselves into the fancy shirt and sprinkle talcum on their hair to turn it gray, it felt as if they were melting into Olaf's clothes. The three Baudelaires looked at one another carefully, but it was as if there were no Baudelaires there at all, just strangers. One with two heads and the other with a head that was covered in fur, all alone in the hinterlands. I think we look utterly unrecognizable, Klaus said, turning with difficulty to face his older sister. Maybe it's because I took off my glasses, but to me we don't look a thing like ourselves. Will you be able to see without your glasses? Violet asked. If I squint, Klaus said, squinting. I can't read like this, but I won't be bumping into anything. If I keep them on, Count Olaf will probably recognize me. Then you'd better keep them off, Violet said, and I'll stop wearing a ribbon in my hair. We'd better disguise our voices, too, Klaus said. I'll try to speak as high as I can, and why don't you try to speak in a low voice, Violet? Good idea. Violet said in as low a voice as she could. And Sonny, you should probably just growl. Grrr, Sonny tried. You sound like a wolf, Violet said, still practicing her disguised tone. Let's tell Madame Lulu that you're half wolf and half person. That would be a miserable experience, Klaus said in the highest voice he could manage. But I suppose being born with two heads wouldn't be any easier. We'll explain to Lulu that we've had miserable experiences, but now we're hoping things will get better working at the carnival. Violet said, and then sighed. That's one thing we don't have to pretend. We have had miserable experiences, and we are hoping that things will get better here. We're almost as freakish as we're pretending to be. Don't say that, Klaus said, and then remembered his no new voice. Don't say that, he said again at a much higher pitch. We're not freaks. We're still the Baudelaire's even if we're wearing Olaf's disguises. I know, Violet said in her new voice, but it's a little confusing pretending to be a completely different person. Grrr, Sunny growled in agreement, and the three children put the rest of Count Olaf's things back in the trunk and walked in silence to Madame Lulu's caravan. It was awkward for Violet and Klaus to walk in the same pair of pants, and Sunny had to keep stopping to brush the beard out of her eyes. It was confusing pretending to be completely different people, particularly because it had been so long since the Baudelaire's were able to be the people they really were. Violet, Klaus, and Sunny did not think of themselves as the sort of children who hid in the trunks of automobiles, or who wore disguises, or who tried to get jobs at the House of Freaks. <clears throat> but the siblings could scarcely remember when they had been able to relax and do the things they liked to do best. It seemed ages since Violet had been able to sit around and think of inventions instead of frantically building something just to get them out of trouble. Klaus could barely remember the last book he'd read for his own enjoyment instead of as research to defeat one of Olaf's schemes. And Sunny had used her teeth many, many times to escape from difficult situations, but it had been a while since she had bitten something recreationally. As the youngsters approached the caravan, it seemed as if each awkward step took them further and further from their real lives as Baudelaire's and into their disguised lives as carnival freaks, and it was indeed very confusing. When Sunny knocked on the door, Madame Lulu called out, Who's there? And for the first time in their lives, it was a confusing question. We're freaks, Violet answered in her disguised voice. We're three, I mean, we're two freaks looking for work. The door opened with a creak, and the children got their first look at Madame Lulu. 
She was wearing a long, shimmering robe that seemed to change colors as she moved, and a turban that looked very much like the one Count Olaf had worn back at Prufrock Preparatory School. She had dark, piercing eyes with two dramatic eyebrows hovering suspiciously as she looked them over. Behind her, sitting at a small, round table, were Count Olaf, Esme Scholar, and Olaf's comrades, who were all staring at the youngsters curiously. As if all of those curious eyes weren't enough, there was one more eye gazing at the Baudelaire's. A glass eye, attached to a chain around Madame Lulu's neck. The eye matched the one painted on her caravan and the one tattooed on Count Olaf's ankle. It was an eye that seemed to follow the Baudelaire's wherever they went, drawing them deeper and deeper into the troubling mystery of their lives. "'Walk in, please,' Madame Lulu said in her strange accent, and the disguised children obeyed. As freakishly as they could, the Baudelaire orphans walked in, taking a few steps closer to all those staring eyes, and a few steps further from the lives they were leaving behind." That's the end of chapter two. That was a long chapter. These books are progressively getting longer, so just beware of that. It'll be longer times between uh, when I can catch up with you guys, so let's do that. It was very confusing. It confused you for a while. Eerie Blue Evenings. Chasing after innocent children. Crow hats are our best gift. Count Olaf is a tiny bit rude. No, Count Olaf is like a massive bit rude. All of her snackings. Poor snackingless Lulu. Drum. Prophetic neutral. An archduke. Judge Hare, Justice Strauss, maybe? Justice Strauss is not Count Olaf or one of his associates. Sweatpants wander around them by themselves all the time. Thank you for the host, Druby. I hope you're doing well. Happy Saturday. It's been a while since you were shoe-sized. Melting cooked children again. I think we look utterly unrecognizable. I think V says that when she dabs. It's true. What a fun grouping of voices. Yeah, I'm learning very early on that my voice work is going to be tested this book. Oh, I'm sorry, Unknown, you're having trouble with the buffering. <laughs> I miss the days of recreational bitings. Oh, Madame Lu oh, wow, I was just looking for freaks. How did you know I need freaks? Yes. Longer read streams and more V-time. That's true. Voice work hype. I got, I found a new flavor of Polar that I've never tried before today at the store, Georgia Peach. So I'm just gonna refill my glass real quick before we move on to chapter three. Two more chapters today. Okay. I don't know what either of those things mean, so I can't answer your question. Okay. <clears throat> Chapter 3. Besides getting several paper cuts in the same day, or receiving the news that someone in your family has betrayed you to your enemies, one of the most unpleasant experiences in life is a job interview. It is very nerve-wracking to explain to someone all the things you can do in the hopes that they will pay you to do them. I once had a very difficult job interview in which I not only had to explain that I could hit an olive with a bow and arrow, memorize up to three pages of poetry, and determine if there was poison mixed into cheese fondue without tasting it, but I had to demonstrate all of these things as well. 
In most cases, the best strategy for a job interview is to be fairly honest because the worst thing that can happen is that you won't get the job and will spend the rest of your life foraging for food in the wilderness and seeking shelter underneath a tree or the awning of a bowling alley that's gone out of business. But in the case of the Baudelaire orphans, job interview with Madame Lulu, the situation was much more desperate. They could not be honest at all because they were disguised as entirely different people, and the worst thing that could happen was being discovered by Count Olaf and his troop and spending the rest of their lives in circumstances so terrible that the children could not bear to think of them. Sit down, please, and Lulu will interview you for carnival job, Madame Lulu said, gesturing to the round table where Olaf and his troop were sitting. Violet and Klaus sat down on one chair with difficulty, and Sunny crawled onto another while everyone watched them in silence. The troop had their elbows on the table and were eating the snacks Lulu had provided with their fingers, while Esme Squalor sipped her buttermilk, and Count Olaf leaned back in his chair and looked at the Baudelaire's very, very carefully. "'It seems to me you look very familiar,' he said. "'Perhaps you have seen before the freaks, my Olaf,' Ol Lulu said. "'What are names of the freaks?' "'My name is Beverly,' Vo Violet said in her low-disguised voice, inventing a name as quickly as she could invent an ironing board. "'And this is my other head, Elliot.' Olaf reached across the table to shake hands, and Violet and Klaus had to stop for a moment to figure out whose arm was sticking out of the right-hand sleeve. "'It's very nice to meet you both,' he said. "'It must be very difficult having two heads.' Oh, yes, Klaus said in as high a voice as he could manage. You can't imagine how troublesome it is to find clothing. I was just noticing your shirt, Esme said. It's very in. Just because we're freaks, Violet said, doesn't mean we don't care about fashion. How about eating? Count Olaf said, his eyes shining brightly. Do you have trouble eating? Well, I, I mean, we, well, we, Klaus said, but before he could go on, Olaf grabbed a long ear of corn from a platter on the table and held it toward the two children. Let's see how much trouble you have, he snarled, and his henchmen began to giggle. Eat this ear of corn, you two-headed freak. Yes, Madame Lulu agreed. It is best way to see if you can work in carnival. Eat corn, eat corn. Violet and Klaus looked at one another and then reached out one hand each to take the corn from Olaf and hold it awkwardly in front of their mouths. Violet leaned forward to take the first bite, but the motion of the corn made it slip from Klaus's hand and fall back down onto the table, and the room roared with cruel laughter. <clears throat> Look at them, one of the white-faced women laughed. They can't even eat an ear of corn, how freakish! Try again, Olaf said with a nasty smile. Pick the corn up from the table, freak. The children picked up the corn and held it to their mouths once more. Klaus squinted and tried to take a bite, but when Violet tried to move the corn to help him, it hit him in the face, and everyone, except for Sunny, of course, laughed once more. "'You are funny freaks,' Ma La Madame Lulu said. She was laughing so hard that she had to wipe her eyes, and when she did, one of her dramatic eyebrows smeared slightly, as if she had a small bruise above one eye. "'Try again, Beverly and Elliot freak!' "'This is the funniest thing I've ever seen,' the hook-handed man said." I always thought people with birth defects were unfortunate, but now I realize they're hilarious. Violet and Klaus wanted to point out that a man with hooks for hands would probably have an equally difficult time eating an ear of corn, but they knew that a job interview is rarely a good time to start arguments, so the siblings swallowed their words and began swallowing corn. After a few bites, the children began to get their bearings, a phrase which here means figure out how two people using only two hands can eat one ear of corn at the same time, but it was still quite a difficult task. The ear of corn was greasy with butter that left damp streaks on their mouths or dripped down their chins. Sometimes the ear of corn would be at a perfect angle for one of them to bite but would be poking the other one in the face, and often the ear of corn would simply slip out of their hands and everyone would laugh yet again. This is more fun than kidnapping, said the bald associate of Olaf's who was shaking with laughter. Lulu, this freak will have people coming from miles around to watch and it all it will cost you is an ear of corn. Is true, please, Madame Lulu agreed and looked down at Violet and Klaus. The crowd loves sloppy eating, she said. You are hired for House of Freaks show. How about that other one, Esme said, giggling and wiping buttermilk from her upper lip. What is that, freak, some sort of living scarf? Chabo, Sunny said to her siblings. She meant something like, I know this is humiliating, but at least our disguises are working. But Violet was quick to disguise her translation. 
This is Chavo the wolf baby, she said in her low voice. Her mother was a hunter who fell in love with a handsome wolf, and this is their poor child. I didn't even know that was possible, said the hook-handed man. Grrr, Sonny growled. It might be funny to watch her eat corn, too, said the bald man, and he grabbed another ear of corn and waved it at the youngest Baudelaire. Here, Chavo, have an ear of corn. Sonny opened her mouth wide, but when the bald man saw the tips of her teeth poking out through the beard, he yanked his hand back in fear. Yikes, he said. That freak is vicious. She's still a bit wild, Klaus said, still speaking as high as he could. In fact, we got all these horrible scars from te teasing her. Grrr, Sonny growled again and bit a piece of silverware to demonstrate how wild she was. Chabo will be excellent carnival attraction, Madame Lulu pronounced. People are always liking a violence, please. You are hired too, Chabo. Just keep her away from me, Esme said. A wolf baby like that would probably ruin my outfit. Grrr, Sonny growled. Come now, freaky people, Esme, <laughs> Madame Lulu said. Madame Lulu will show you to the caravan, please, while you will do the sleeping. We'll stay here and have more wine, Count Olaf said. Congratulations on the new freaks, Lulu. I knew you'd have good luck with me around. Everyone does, Esme said and kissed Olaf on the cheek. Madame Lulu scowled and led the children out of her caravan and into the night. Uh, follow me, freaks, please, she said. You will be living, please, in freaks' caravan. You will share with other freaks. There is Hugo, Colette, and Kevin, all freaks. Every day will be House of Freaks show. Beverly and Elliot, you will be eating of corn, please. Chavo, you will be attacking of audience, please. Are there any freaky questions? Will we be paid? Klaus asked. He was thinking that having some money might help the Baudelaire's if they learned the answers to their questions and had an opportunity to get away from the carnival. Uh, no, 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 Madame Lulu said. A uh, Madame Lulu will be giving no money to the freaks, please. If you are a freak, you are lucky that someone will give you work. Look at man with hooks for hands. He is grateful to do the working for Count Olaf, even though Olaf will not be giving him of the Baudelaire fortune. Count Olaf? Violet asked, pretending that her worst enemy was a complete stranger. Is that the gentleman with the one eyebrow? That is Olaf, Lulu said. He is a brilliant man, but do not be saying the wrong things to him, please. Madam Lulu always says you must give people what they want, so always tell Olaf he is brilliant man. We'll remember that, Klaus said. Good, please, Madam Lulu said. Now, here is Freak Caravan. Welcome, freaks, to your new home. The fortune teller had stopped at a caravan with the word freaks painted on it in large sloppy letters. The letters were smeared and dripping in several places, as if the paint was still wet, but the word was so faded that the Baudelaire's knew the caravan had been labeled many years ago. Next to the caravan was a shabby tent with several holes in it and a sign reading, Welcome to the House of Freaks, with a small drawing of a girl with three eyes. Madame Lulu strode past the sign to knock on the caravan's wooden door. Freaks! Madame Lulu cried. Please wake up, please! New freaks are here for you to say hello! Just a minute, Madame Lulu, called a voice from behind the door. No, just a minute, please, Madame Lulu said. Now, I am the boss of the carnival. The door swung open to reveal a sleepy-looking man with a hunchback, a word which here means a back with a hump near the shoulder, giving a person a somewhat irregular appearance. He was wearing a pair of pajamas that were ripped at the shoulder to make room for his hunchback and holding a small candle to help him see in the dark. I know you are the boss, Madame Lulu, the man said, but it's the middle of the night. Don't you want your fre freaks to be well rested? Madame Lulu does not particularly care about sleep of freaks, Lulu said haughtily. Please be telling the new freaks what to do for show tomorrow. The freak with two heads will be eating corn, please, and the little wolf freak will be attacking audience. Violence and sloppy eating, the man said and sighed. I guess the crowd will like that. Of course crowd will like, Lulu said, and then Carnival will get much money. And then maybe you'll pay us, the man asked. Fat chance, please, Madame Lulu replied. Good night, freaks. Good night, Madame Lulu, replied Violet, who would have rather been called a proper name, even if it was one she invented, than simply freak. But the fortune teller walked away without looking back. The Baudelaire stood in the doorway of the caravan for a moment, watching Lulu disappear into the night, before looking up at the man and introducing themselves a bit more properly. My name is Beverly, Violet said. My second head is named Elliot, and this is Chavo, the wolf baby. Grrr, growled Sonny. I'm Hugo, the man said. It'll be nice to have new co-workers. Come on inside the caravan, I'll introduce you to the others. 
Still finding it awkward to walk, Violet and Klaus followed Hugo inside, and Sunny followed her siblings, preferring to crawl rather than walk, because it made her seem more half-wolf. The caravan was small, but the children could see by the light of Hugo's candle that it was tidy and clean. There was a small wooden table in the center with a set of dominoes stacked up in the center and several chairs grouped around. In one corner was a rack with clothing hung on it, including a long row of identical coats, and a large mirror so you could comb your hair and make sure you looked presentable. There was a small stove for cooking meals with a few pots and pans stacked alongside it, and a few potted plants lined up near the window. window so they would get enough sunlight. Violet would have liked to add a small workbench she could use while inventing things. Klaus would have been pleased to be squinting at some bookshelves, and Sunny would have preferred to see a stack of raw carrots or other food that are pleasant to bite, but otherwise the caravan seemed like a cozy place to live. The only thing that seemed to be missing was some place to sleep, but as Hugo walked further into the room, the children saw that there were three hammocks, which are long, wide pieces of cloth used for beds, hanging from places on the walls. One hammock was empty, the Baudelaire supposed that was where Hugo slept, but in another they could see a tall skinny woman with curly hair squinting down at them, and in the third was a man with a very wrinkled face who was still asleep. Kevin, Hugo, Hugo called up to the sleeping man. Kevin, get up, we have new co-workers and I'll need help setting up more hammocks. The man frowned and glared down at Hugo. I wish you hadn't woken me up, Kevin said. I was having a delightful dream that there was nothing wrong with me at all instead of being a freak. The Baudelaire's took a good look at Kevin as he lowered himself to the floor and were unable to see anything the least bit freakish about him, but he stared at the Baudelaire's as if he'd seen a ghost. My word, he said, you two have it as bad as I do. Try to be polite, Kevin, Hugo said. This is Beverly and Elliot, and there on the floor is Chabo the wolf baby. Wolf baby? Kevin repeated, shaking Violet and Klaus's shared right hand. Is she dangerous? She doesn't like to be teased, Violet said. I don't like to be teased either, Kevin said and hung his head. But wherever I go, I hear people whispering. There goes Kevin, the ambidextrous freak. Ambidextrous? Klaus said. Doesn't that mean you're both right-handed and left-handed? So you've heard of me, Kevin said. Is that why you traveled out here to the hinterland so you could stare at somebody who can write his name with either his left hand or his right? No, Klaus said. I just know the word ambidextrous from a book I read. I had a feeling you'd be smart, Hugo said. After all, you have twice as many brains as most people. I only have one brain, Kevin said sadly. One brain, two ambidextrous arms, and two ambidextrous legs. Oh, what a freak. It's better than being a hunchback, Hugo said. Your hands may be freaky, but you have absolutely normal shoulders. What good are normal shoulders, Kevin said, when they're attached to hands that are equally good at using a knife and a fork? Oh, Kevin, the woman said and climbed down from her hammock to give him a pat on the head. I know it's depressing being so freakish, but try and look on the bright side. At least you're better off than me. She turned to the children and gave them a shy smile. My name is Colette, she said, and if you're going to laugh at me, I'd prefer you do it now to get it over with. The Baudelaire's looked at Colette and then at one another. Renouf, Sonny said, which meant something like, I don't see anything freakish about you either, but even if I did, I wouldn't laugh at you because that's not polite. I bet that's some kind of wolf laugh. Colette said, but I don't blame Chabo for laughing at a contortionist. Contortionist? Violet asked. Yes, Colette sighed. I can bend my body into all sorts of unusual positions. Look. The Baudelaire's watched as Colette sighed again and launched into a contortionist routine. First she bent down so her head was between her legs, then curled up into a tiny ball on the floor. Then she pushed one hand against the ground and lifted her entire body up on just a few fingers, braiding her legs together into a spiral. Finally, she flipped up in the air, balanced for a moment on her head, and twisted her arms and legs together like a mass of twine before looking up at the Baudelaire's with a sad frown. You see, Colette said, I'm a complete freak. Wow, Sonny shrieked. I thought that was amazing, Violet said, and so did Chabo. That's very polite of you to say so, Colette said, but I am ashamed that I'm a contortionist. But if you're ashamed of it, Klaus said, why don't you just move your body normally instead of doing contortions? Because I'm in the House of Freaks, Elliot, Colette said. Nobody would pay to see me move my body normally. 
It's an interesting dilemma, Hugo said, using a fancy word for problem that the Baudelaire's had learned from a law book in Justice Strauss's library. All three of us would rather be normal people than freaks, but tomorrow morning people will be waiting in that tent for Colette to twist up her body into strange positions, for Beverly and Elliot to eat corn, for Chavo to growl and attack the crowd, for Kevin to write his name with both hands, and for me to try on one of those coats. Madame Lulu says we must always give people what they want, and they want freaks performing on a stage. Come now, it's very late at night. Kevin, give me a helping hand putting up hammocks for the newcomers, and, that's, and then let's all just try to get some sleep. I might as well give you two helping hands, Kevin said glumly. They're both equally efficient. Oh, I wish that I was either right-handed or left-handed. Try to cheer up, Colette said gently. Maybe a miracle will happen tomorrow, and we'll get all of the things we wish for most. No one in the caravan said anything more, but as Hugo and Kevin prepared two hammocks for the three Baudelaire's, the children thought about what Colette had said. Miracles are like meatballs, because nobody can exactly agree what they are made of, where they come from, or how often they should appear. Some people say that a sunrise is a miracle, because it is somewhat mysterious and often very beautiful. But other people say it's simply a fact of life, because it happens every day and far too early in the morning. Some people say that a telephone is a miracle, because it sometimes seems wondrous that you can talk with somebody who is thousands of miles away, and other people say it is simply a manufactured device fashioned out of metal parts, electronic cir circuitry, and wires that are very easily cut. And some people say that sneaking out of a hotel is a miracle, particularly if the lobby is swarming with policemen, and other people say it is simply a fact of life because it happens every day and far too early in the morning. So you might think that there are so many miracles in the world that you can scarcely count them, or that there's so few that, you're, that they're scarcely worth mentioning, depending on whether you spend your mornings gazing at a beautiful sunset or lowering yourself into a back alley with a rope fashioned out of matching towels. But there was one miracle the Baudelaire's were thinking about as they lay in their hammocks and tried to sleep, and this was the sort of miracle that felt bigger than any meatball the world has ever seen. The hammocks creaked in the caravan as Violet and Klaus tried to get comfortable in one set of clothing, and Sunny tried to arrange Olaf's beard so that it wouldn't be too scratchy, and all three youngsters thought about a miracle so wondrous and beautiful that it made their hearts ache to think about it. The miracle, of course, was that one of their parents was alive after all, that either their father or their mother had somehow survived the fire that had destroyed their home and begun the children's unfortunate journey. To have one more Baudelaire alive was such an enormous and unlikely miracle that the children were almost afraid to wish for it, but they wished for it anyway. The youngsters thought of what Colette had said, that maybe a miracle would happen, and that they would get all the things they had wished for most. And waiting for morning to come, when Madame Lulu's crystal ball might bring that miracle the Baudelaire's were wishing for. At last the sun rose as it does every day and very early in the morning. The three children had slept very little and wished very much and now they watched the caravan slowly fill with light and listened to Hugo, Colette, and Kevin shift in their hammocks and wondered if Count Olaf had entered the fortune teller's tent yet and if he had learned anything there. And just when they could stand it no more, they heard the sound of hurrying footsteps and a loud metallic knock on the door. Wake up, wake up, came the voice of the hook-handed man. But before I write down what he said, I must tell you that there is one more similarity between a miracle and a meatball. And it, it, is, and it is that they both might appear to be one thing, but turn out to be another. It happened to me once at a cafeteria, when it turned out there was a small camera hidden in the lunch I received. And it happened to Violet, Klaus, and Sonny now, although it was quite some time before they learned that what the hook-handed man said turned out to be something different from what they thought when they heard him outside the door of the freak's caravan. Wake up, the hook-handed man said again and pounded on the door. Wake up and hurry up. I'm in a very bad mood and have no time for your nonsense. It's a very busy day at the carnival. Madame Lulu and Count Olaf are running errands, and I'm in charge of the House of Freaks. The crystal ball revealed that one of those blasted Baudelaire parents is still alive, and the gift caravan is almost out of figurines. End of chapter three. Sounds like a typical job interview. I was hoping Klaus was Beverly. Oh, 
Oh, I mean, I know who PewDiePie is, but I didn't know who T-Series was. I guess it doesn't really matter. Like, both of them will continue to make a living, I'm sure. I wish sloppy eating got me more jobs. Yeah, me too. <laughs> oh, I hope your finger's okay. Oh, bye, unknown. I didn't realize you slipped out. Have a good one. I like Winto more than Window, though. I have that same dream, Kevin. You want to be right-handed or left-handed and not ambidextrous? Why are you wolf laughing? Give the people what they want. Grilled children. <laughs> Banana phones are a miracle. Bahamas, bananas, grilled children cheese. Thank you for the claps. No, I want to be not seen as a freak. I don't see you as a freak. Does anybody else? For some reason, my cheek is like achy and I don't know why. Maybe my sinuses are like sore. It's not really on this side, but like right, kind of like my cheekbone, I'm like toward my, I don't know why. It's like tender. That's a weird thing for me to just say, but we are we are all freaks, please. <clears throat> okay. One more chapter, are we ready? <clears throat> I am actually real quick before I jump into the next chapter, this um music uh is almost uh, over, so I'm going to pick another music. Okay. <clears throat> Gets unready. Okay, now we're ready. <clears throat> Chapter four. What? Asked Hugo, yawning and rubbing his eyes. What did you say? I said, the gift caravan is almost out of figurines, the hook-handed man said from behind the door. But that's not your concern. People are already arriving at the carnival, so you freaks need to be ready in 15 minutes. Oh, wait a moment, sir, uh, sir. Violet thought to use her low-disguised voice just in time, as she and her brother climbed down from their hammock, still sharing a single pair of pants. Sunny was already on the floor, too astonished to remember to growl. Did you say that one of the Baudelaire parents is still alive? The door of the caravan opened a crack, and the children could see the face of the hook-handed man peering at them suspiciously. "'What do you care, freaks?' he asked. "'Well,' Klaus said, thinking quickly, "'we've been reading about the Baudelaire's in the Daily Punctilio. We're very interested in the case of those three murderous children.' "'Well,' the hook-handed man said, "'those kids' parents were supposed to be dead, but Madame Lulu looked into her crystal ball and said that one of them was still alive. It's a long story, but it means we're all going to be very busy.' Count Olaf and Madame Lulu had to leave early this morning to run an important errand, so I'm now in charge of the House of Freaks. That means I get to boss you around, so hurry up and get ready for the show. Grrr, Sonny growled. Chavo's all set to perform, Violet said, and the rest of us will be ready soon. You'd better be, the hook-handed man said, and began to shut the door before stopping for a moment. That's funny, he said. It looks like one of your scars is blurry. They blur as they heal, Klaus said. Too bad, the hook-handed man said. It makes you look less freakish. He slammed the door and the siblings could hear him walk away from the caravan. I feel sorry for that man, Colette remarked as she swung down from her hammock and curled into a contortion on the floor. Every time he and that count person come to visit, it makes me feel bad to look at his hooks. He's better off than me, Kevin said, yawning and stretching his ambidextrous arms. At least one of his hooks is stronger than the other one. My arms and legs are exactly alike. And mine are very bendable, Colette said. Well, we'd better do as the man says and get ready for the show. That's right, Hugo agreed, pull reaching into a shelf next to his hammock and pulling out a toothbrush. Madame Lulu says we must always give the people what they want, and that man wants us to get ready right away. Here, Chabo. Violet said, looking down at her sister. I'll help you sharpen your teeth. 
Grrr, Sunny agreed, and the two older Baudelaire's leaned down together and lifted Sunny up and moved into a corner so the three children could whisper to one another near the mirror, while Hugo, Colette, and Kevin performed their toilet, a phrase which here means did the things necessary to begin their day as carnival freaks. What do you think? Klaus said. Do you think it's really possible that one of our parents is alive? I don't know, Violet said. On one hand, it's hard to believe that Madame Lulu really has a magical crystal ball. On the other hand, she always told Count Olaf where we were so he could come and find us. I don't know what to believe. Tent, Sunny whispered. I think you're right, Sunny, Klaus said. If we could sneak into the fortune-telling tent, we might be able to find out something for ourselves. You're whispering about me, aren't you? Kevin called out from the other end of the caravan. I bet you're saying, what a freak Kevin is. Sometimes he shaves with his left hand and sometimes he shaves with his right hand, but it doesn't matter because they're exactly the same. We weren't talking, we weren't talking about you, Kevin, Violet said. We were discussing the Baudelaire case. I've never heard of these Baudelaire's, Hugo said, combing his hair. Did I hear you mention they were murderers? That's what it says in the Daily Punctilio, Klaus said. Oh, I never read the newspaper, Kevin said. Holding it in both of my equally strong hands makes me feel like a freak. That's better than me, Colette said. I can contort myself into a position that allows me to pick up a newspaper with my tongue. Talk about freakish. It's an interesting dilemma, Hugo said, grabbing one of the identical coats from the rack. But I think we're all equally freakish. Now let's get out of there and put... Let's get out there and put on a good show. The Baudelaire's followed their co-workers out of the caravan and over to the House of Freak's tent, where the hook-handed man was standing impatiently, holding something long and damp in one of his hooks. "'Get inside and put on a good show,' he ordered, gesturing to a flap in the tent that served as an entrance. Madame Lulu said that if you don't give the in Madame Lulu said that if you don't give the audience what they want, I'm allowed to use this tagliatelle grande.' What's a tagliatelle grande? Colette asked. Tagliatelle is a type of Italian noodle, the hook-handed man explained, uncoiling the long and damp object. And grande means big in Italian. This is a big noodle that a carnival worker cooked up for me this morning. Olaf's comrade waved the big noodle over his head, and the Baudelaire's and their co-workers heard a limp swishing sound as it moved slowly through the air, as if a large earthworm were crawling nearby. If you don't do what I say, the hook-handed man continued, I get to hit you with the tagliatelle grande, which I've heard is an unpleasant and somewhat sticky experience. Don't worry, sir, Hugo said. We're professionals. I'm glad to hear it, the hook-handed man sneered and followed them all into the house of freaks. Inside, the tent looked even bigger, particularly because there wasn't very much to see in such a large space. There was a wooden stage with a few folding chairs placed on it and a banner overhead which read House of Freaks in large sloppy letters. There was a small stand where one of the white-faced women was selling cold beverages, and there were seven or eight people milling around waiting for the show to begin. Madame Lulu had mentioned that business had been slow at Caligari Carnival, but the siblings had still expected a few more people to show up to see the carnival freaks. As the children and their co-workers approached the stage, the hook-handed man began speaking to the small group of people as if they were a vast crowd. "'Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, adolescents of both genders,' he announced." Hurry up and buy your delicious cold beverages because the House of Freaks show is about to begin. Look at all those freaks, giggled one member of the audience, a middle-aged man with several large pimples on his chin. There's a man with hooks instead of hands. I'm not one of the freaks, the hook-handed man growled. I work here at the carnival. Oh, I'm sorry, the man said. But if you don't mind my saying so, if you purchased a pair of realistic hands, no one would make that mistake. It's not polite to comment on other people's appearances. The hook-handed man said sternly. Now, ladies and gentlemen, gaze with horror on Hugo, the hunchback. Instead of a regular back, he has a big hump that makes him look very freakish. That's true, said the pimpled man, who seemed willing to giggle at one person or another. What a freak. The hook-handed man waved his large noodle in the air as a limp reminder to the Baudelaire's and the co-workers. Hugo, he barked, put on your coat. As the audience tittered, Hugo walked to the front of the stage and tried to put on the coat he was holding. Usually, if someone has a body with an unusual shape, they will hire a tailor to alter their clothing so it will fit comfortably and attractively. But as Hugo struggled with the coat, it was clear that no such tailor had been hired. 
Hugo's hump wrinkled on the back of the coat and then stretched it and then finally ripped it as he did up the buttons so that within moments the coat was just a few pieces of tattered cloth. Blushing, Hugo retreated to the back of the stage and sat on a folding chair as the members of the tidy audience howled with laughter. "'Isn't that hilarious?' the hook-handed man said. "'He can't even put on a coat! What a freakish person!' "'But wait, ladies and gentlemen, there's more!' Olaf's henchman shook the Tagliatelle Grande again while reaching into his pocket with his other hook. Smiling wickedly, he withdrew an ear of corn and held it up for the audience to see. "'This is a simple ear of corn,' he announced. "'But it's something that any normal person could eat. "'But here at Caligari Carnival, we don't have a house of normal people. "'We have a house of freaks, with a brand new freak "'that will turn this ear of corn into a hilarious mess.'" Violet and Klaus sighed and walked to the center of the stage, and I do not think that I have to describe this tiresome show any longer. You can undoubtedly guess that the two eldest Baudelaire's were forced to eat another ear of corn while a small group of people laughed at them, and that Colette was forced to twist her body into unusual shapes and positions, and that Kevin had to write his name with both his left hand and right hand, and that finally poor Sonny was forced to growl at the audience, although she was not a ferocious person by nature and would have preferred to greet them politely. And you can imagine how the crowd reacted as the hook-handed man announced each person and forced them to do these things. The seven or eight people laughed and shouted cruel names and made terrible and tasteless jokes, and one woman even threw her cold beverage, paper cup and all, at Kevin, as if someone who was both right-handed and left-handed somehow deserved to have wet and sticky stains on his shirt. But what you may not be able to imagine, unless you have had a similar experience yourself, is how humiliating it was to participate in such a show. You might think that being humiliating, humiliated, like riding a bicycle or decoding a secret message would get easier after you had done it a few times. But the Baudelaire's had been laughed at more than a few times and it did not make their experience in the House of Freaks easier at all. Violet remembered when a girl named Carmelita Spatz had laughed at her and called her names, when the children were enrolled in Proofrock Preparatory School, but it still hurt her feelings when the hook-handed man announced her as something hilarious. Klaus remembered when Esme Squalor had insulted him at 667 Dark Avenue, but he still blushed when the audience pointed and giggled every time the ear of corn slipped out of his hands. And Sonny remembered all of the times that Count Olaf had laughed at all three Baudelaire's and their misfortune, but she still felt embarrassed and a little sick when the people called her Wolf Freak as she followed the other performers out of the tent when the show was over. The Baudelaire orphans even knew that they weren't really a two-headed person and a wolf baby, but as they sat with their co-workers in the freak's caravan afterward, they felt so humiliated that it was as if they were as freakish as everyone thought. I don't like this place. I don't like this place, Violet said to Kevin and Colette, sharing a chair with her brother at the caravan's table, while Hugo made hot chocolate at the stove. She was so upset that she almost forgot to speak in a low voice. I don't like being stared at, and I don't like being laughed at. If people think it's funny when someone drops an ear of corn, they should stay home and drop it themselves. Kawoon, Sunny agreed, forgetting to growl. She meant something along the lines of, I thought I was going to cry when all those people were calling me freak. But luckily, only her siblings understood her, so she didn't give away her disguise. Don't worry, Klaus said to his sisters. I don't think we'll stay here very long. The fortune-telling tent is closed today because Count Olaf and Mount Lulu are running that important errand. The middle Baudelaire did not need to add that it would be a good time to sneak into the tent and find out if Lulu's crystal ball really held the answers they were seeking. Why do you care if Lulu's tent is closed? Colette asked. You're a freak, not a fortune teller. And why don't you want to stay here? Kevin asked. Caligari Carnival hasn't been very popular lately, but there's nowhere else for a freak to go. Of course there is, Violet said. Lots of people are ambidextrous, Kevin. There are ambidextrous florists and ambidextrous aircraft traffic controllers and all sorts of things. You really think so? Kevin asked. Of course I do, Violet said. And it's the same with contortionists or hunchbacks. All of us could find some other type of job where people didn't think we were freakish at all. I'm not sure that's true, Hugo called over from the stove. I think that a two-headed person's going to be considered pretty freakish no matter where they go. And it's probably the same for an ambidextrous person, Kevin said with a sigh. Let's try to forget our troubles and play dominoes, Hugo said, bringing over a tray with six steaming mugs of hot chocolate. 
I thought both of your heads might want to drink separately, he explained with a smile, particularly because this hot chocolate is a little bit unusual. Chabo the wolf baby added a little bit of cinnamon. Chabo added it? Klaus asked with surprise as Sunny growled modestly. Yes, Hugo said. At first I thought it was some freaky wolf recipe, but it's actually quite tasty. That was a clever idea, Chabo, Klaus said and gave his sister a squinty smile. It seemed only a little while ago that the youngest Baudelaire couldn't walk and was small enough to fit inside a birdcage, and now she was developing her own interests and was big enough to seem half-wolf. You should be very proud of yourself, Hugo agreed. If you weren't a freak, Chabo, you could grow up to be an excellent chef. She could be a chef anyway, Violet said. Elliot, would you mind if we stepped outside to enjoy our hot chocolate? That's a good idea, Klaus said quickly. I've always considered hot chocolate to be an outdoor beverage, and I'd like to take a peek in the gift caravan. Grrr, Sunny growled, but her siblings knew she meant, I'll come with you, and she crawled over to where Violet and Klaus were awkwardly rising from their chair. Don't be too long, Colette said. We're not supposed to wander around the carnival. We'll just drink our hot chocolate and come right back, Klaus promised. I hope you don't get in trouble, Kevin said. I'd hate to think of the Tagliatel Grande hitting both of your heads. The Baudelaire's were just about to point out that a blow from the Tagliatel Grande probably wouldn't hurt one bit when they heard a noise which was far more fearsome than a large noodle waving in the air. Even from inside the caravan, the children could hear a loud, creaky noise they recognized from their long trip into the hinterlands. That sounds like that gentleman friend of Madame Lulu's, Hugo said. That's the sound of his car. There's another sound, too, Colette said. Listen. The children listened and heard that the contortionist had spoken the truth. Accompanying the roar of the engine was another roar, one that sounded deeper and angrier than any automobile. The Baudelaire's knew that you cannot judge something by its sound any more than you can judge a person by the way they look, but this roar was so loud and fierce that the youngsters could not imagine that it brought good news. Here I must interrupt the story I am writing and tell you another story in order to make an important point. This second story is fictional, a word, a word which here means somebody made it up one day, as opposed to the story of the Baudelaire orphans which somebody merely wrote down, usually at night. It is called... The story of Queen Debbie and her boyfriend, Tony. And it goes something like this. <clears throat> the story of Queen Debbie and her boyfriend, Tony. Once upon a time, there lived a fictional queen named Queen Debbie, who ruled over the land where this story takes place, which is made up. This fictional land had lollipop trees growing everywhere and singing mice that did all of the chores, and there were fierce and fictional lions who guarded the palace against fictional enemies. <clears throat> Queen Debbie had a boyfriend named Tony, who lived in the neighboring fictional kingdom. Because they lived so far away, Debbie and Tony couldn't see each other that often, but occasionally they would go out to dinner and a movie or do other fictional things together. <coughs> Tony's birthday arrived, and Queen Debbie had some royal business and couldn't travel to see him, but she sent him a nice card and a mina bird in a shiny cage. The proper thing to do if you receive a present, of course, is to write a thank you note, but Tony was not a particularly proper person and called Debbie to complain. Debbie, this is Tony, Tony said. I got the birthday present you sent me and I don't like it at all. I'm sorry to hear that, Queen Debbie said, plucking a lollipop off a nearby tree. I picked out this minor bird especially for you. What sort of present would you prefer? Well, I think you should give me a bunch of valuable diamonds, said Tony, who was as greedy as he was fictional. Diamonds, Queen Debbie said, but mina birds can cheer you up when you're sad. You can teach them to sit on your hand and sometimes they even talk. I want diamonds, Tony said. But diamonds are so valuable, Queen Debbie said. If I send you diamonds in the mail, they'll probably get stolen on their way to you and then you won't have any birthday present at all. I want diamonds, whined Tony, who was really becoming quite tiresome. I know what I'll do, Queen Debbie said with a faint smile. I'll feed my diamonds to the royal lions, and then I'll send the lions to your kingdom. No one would dare attack a bunch of fierce lions, so the diamonds are sure to arrive safely. Hurry up, uh, Tony said. It's supposed to be my special day. It was easy for Queen Debbie to hurry up, because the singing mice who lived in her palace did all of her necessary chores. So it only took a few minutes for her to feed a bunch of diamonds to her lions, wrapping the jewels in tuna fish first so the lions would agree to eat them. Then she instructed the lions tr to travel to the neighboring kingdom to deliver the present. Tony waited impatiently outside of his house for the rest of the day, eating all of the ice cream and cake and teasing his mina bird, and finally, at just about sunset, he saw the lions approaching on the horizon and ran over to collect his present. 
Now give me those diamonds, you stupid lions, Tony cried. And there is no need to tell you the rest of this story, which has the rather obvious moral, never look a gift lion in the mouth. The point is that there are times where the arrival of a bunch of lions is good news, particularly in a fictional story where the lions are not real and so probably will not hurt you. There are some cases, as in the case of Queen Debbie and her boyfriend Tony, where the arrival of lions means that the story is about to get much better. But I am sad to say that the case of the Baudelaire orphans is not one of those times. The story of the Baudelaire's does not take place in a fictional land where lollipops grow on trees and singing mice do all of the chores. The story of the Baudelaire's takes place in a very real world, where some people are laughed at just because they have something wrong with them, and where people can find themselves all alone in the world, struggling to understand the sinister mystery that surrounds them. And in this real world, the arrival of lions means that the story is about to get much worse. And if you do not have a stomach for such a story, any more than lions have a stomach for diamonds not coated in tuna fish, it would be best if you turned around right now and ran the other way, as the Baudelaire's wished they could as they exited the caravan and saw what Count Olaf had brought with him when he returned from his errand. Count Olaf drove his black automobile between the rows of caravans, nearly running over several visitors to the carnival, stopped right at the tent for the House of Freaks, and turned off the engine, which ended the creaky roar the children had recognized. But the other, angrier roar continued as Olaf got out of the car, followed by Madame Lulu, and pointed with a flourish to a trailer that was attached to the rear of his automobile. The trailer was really more of a metal cage on wheels, and through the bars of the cage, the Baudelaire's could see what the villain was pointing at. The trailer was filled with lions, packed in so tightly that the children couldn't tell just how many there were. The lions were unhappy to be traveling in such tight quarters, and were showing their unhappiness by scratching at the cage with their claws, snapping at one another with their long teeth, and roaring as loudly and as fiercely as they could. Some of Count Olaf's henchmen gathered around, along with several visitors to the carnival, to see what was going on, and Olaf tried to say something to them, but couldn't be heard over the lion's roars. Frowning, the villain removed a whip from his pocket and whipped at the lions through the trailer bars. Like people, animals will become frightened and likely do whatever you say if you whip them enough, and the lions finally quieted down so Olaf could make his announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, he said, boys and girls, freaks and normal people, Caligari Carnival is proud to announce the arrival of these fierce lions who will be used in a new attraction. That's good news, said someone in the crowd, because the souvenirs in the gift caravan are pretty lousy. It is good news, Count Olaf agreed with a snarl and turned to face the Baudelaire's. His eyes were shining very brightly, and the siblings shivered in their disguises as he looked at the children and then at the gathering crowd. Things are about to get much better around here, he said, and the Baudelaire orphans knew that this was as fictional as anything they could imagine. And that's the end of chapter four. And all I'm going to read today, let me catch up. Riddy wanders around like sweatpants by themselves. Tender cheeks. Yeah, I, I don't know what's up with this side. Excuse me. I've watched V more than I've watched myself. Uh, yeah, I, I think I just have streamed more. Yeah, that 333.33 was pretty cool. Kevin, this isn't about you. What is Timmy Trumpet Freaks? Kevin is Kevin from Up as an adult. Is Kevin the name of the kid? No, that's Russell. Bomb diffusing music. My favorite type of music. Hey, Mystic, how's it going? I hope you get some good rest today. That is like my Sunday when I plan to get whipped by spaghetti and later slapped by lasagna. <laughs> oh, candid man with a swimming noodle. Yeah. Hot chocolate. Hunchbacks can get jobs at churches. Great bell ringers. I, the hot chocolate does actually sound really good right now. I don't have any, though, I don't think. Is this same Debbie from Lil Debbie? <laughs> 7 out of 10 Tony voice because you're not really a Tony. What am I, freaking mine a bird? 
He got the diamonds he wanted. He was put inside the tummy of the lions. Dumb Tony. Tony has lost all meaning to me. Sparkly tuna. And before there were two lions and they couldn't count that high. Whip it good. Thank you very much for clapping and for the compliments. Oh, Kevin is the bird. That's right. It's been a long time since I've seen Up. All right, guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed yourselves today for our first installment of the Carnivorous Carnival. Um, I'm going to go hang out and chill out, and I have a bunch of uh, Pokemon level grinding to do for our uh, Elite Four battles in um, on Monday morning, which I am looking forward to doing. So I will talk to you guys later and soon. I'll see you guys on Monday. Um, me and Tara will be back for that. Enjoy the rest of your day. Um, as always, much love from me to you. Take care of yourselves, and I'll see you soon. Bye.